Meanwhile, the news protesting NLC and TUC members ground activities at Abuja Airport. President Tinubu launches digital birth, death and registration system for population data management. And House of Reps Committee on Army unveils robust four-year plan to tackle insecurity. Hello, welcome to News Now. I am Simisola Atigo. Members of the Nigeria Labour Congress NLC and the Trade Union Congress TUC have mobilized their members for a protest at the Namdi Azikiwe International Airport in Abuja earlier on Thursday. The protest was part of a series of actions that the two labor unions say they will zero in on Imo State following the attack on the NLC President Joe Ajairo. Organized Labour had earlier declared a nationwide strike which will commence on Tuesday, November 14, also because of the face-off with the Imo state government. Both the NLC and TUC insist it will go ahead with the industrial action if the government fails to meet its demand, which include the resignation of police officials. To deliberate more on this development, political affairs analyst Adeni Kunu joins me on the news. Thank you for your time, Mr. Kunu. Now, the NLC earlier today grounded activities at the Abuja airport, and there are reports that same happened in Oweri. Is this a well thought out plan? I mean, why should Nigerians be made to suffer for what happened to the NLC president in Oweri? It is the right of the NLC to protest. It is their right to actually be strategic about the protest that they carry out. Now, I wouldn't know if it was wise enough to do that in Abuja, but I think that to have gone specifically to prevent um, flights that are heading for um, uh, Oweri, the Imo state capital, I think that that is something quite strategic. But at the same time, what are the issues raised by the NLC? The NLC helmsman went to Oweri. He was beaten near death and requested that the police officers that caused injury to himself and some other persons whose injuries have not been reported be sacked. And of course, this is about not paying over 40 months of pensions of workers and certain persons that were owed. One would have expected that at least such a thing is responded to. But I do not know if it is fair on every other person that you know was supposed to have actually gone on air this morning or particularly taking a flight to their respective destinations for their businesses. And this also teaches a lesson that when you have such incidences as, you know, the, the organized labor members being attacked, it is not a mere issue. These people represent the Nigerian workers. And you should understand that they've been called to represent them in every area. So I think that the government did them. And the federal government should also understand that when it is about the NLC, that is a national body that represents workers, it has to act quickly. I have not seen a situation where the police says they rescue somebody. And you're talking about rescuing somebody and it was almost beaten to death. So I think that there are issues we should raise as fundamental. Although I want to say that other persons, businesses, and of course their uh, respective uh, concerns have been affected by the protest. But I also think that it's a learning curve for the government to always intervene when we have such incidences come up so that we can prevent colossal economic loss such as we have recorded today at the nation's capital. All right. Now, at least the government says it has redeployed the Imo State Commissioner, a uh, police commissioner. Um, the union, labor unions, accused of being responsible for the attack on Ajero. But what precedent is, or rather, what role should the federal government be playing in this face-off? Fantastic. Do not forget that there is no state police in this country. And the police that were deployed, where Ajero were beaten, were actually police representing the federal government of Nigeria. It is based on that understanding that the president of this country, His Excellency President Bolamet Tinubu, would have intervened. Because the police forces in this country are under the auspices of the executive arm of government. You would have expected, therefore, that after labor raised issues with what almost killed Ajero, that he had to be rushed out of the country for treatment, the federal government would have called in first the Inspector General of Police and the State Commissioner of Police and spoken to them. In fact, the government would have actually demonstrated its readiness to address this issue by suspending those persons because you wouldn't tell me they don't have names. Government should have actually taken both steps 
suspend some persons who could be identified as part of the security forces that took Ajero to wherever they kept him. Don't forget that at some point after he was beaten, he was incommunicado until the police issued a statement that they rescued him from the thugs. So how did you rescue somebody from thugs? And how did you do it in such a way that you could not even arrest a thug, but you had thugs? So how did thugs get away, but you were able to rescue a man that was being beaten? Is it that the police want to tell us that the thugs are now superior to them in terms of capacity for protection of human lives and, and property? That is what the opening chapter of the Constitution talked about, that it is the duty of government to protect lives and property. In the absence of that, both the state government, but essentially the federal government, that only the police of this yeah. country would have done something. So I think that that is also another important part that should have been done to have avoided this kind of uh, a problem at the nation's uh, capital today. All right, political affairs analyst Adeni Yukunu, thank you for uh, giving your thoughts on this development. Moving on, President Balantinobo says accurate information on the size, characteristics, and distribution of the nation's population is imperative both for planning and for the effective delivery of public services to Nigerians. Speaking at the launch of the Digital Civil Registration and Vital Statistics System and the National Geospatial Data Repository at the State House on Wednesday, President Tinubu says Nigeria's population remains the greatest asset the nation wields in the broader mission to become one of the largest economies in the world. This couldn't have come at a better time than when the National Population Commission is planning for another census of its citizens. President Tinubu says the civil registration and vital statistics system is a basic building block of an identity ecosystem to improve service delivery. The Commission has made substantial progress in quest to deliver the first digital population and housing census. It is my hope. The result of the census will provide the nation with much needed data for development planning and the enthronement of good governance. The chairman of the National Population Commission highlights the objectives of these projects, which will give timeless access to statistics on vital events. This transformative innovation is being implemented through a public private partnership, partnership arrangement, PPP, between the MPC and the Banksford Technology Limited, a reputable and innovative local ICT solution provider with a track record of success in ICT solution provision with government agencies, with strong support and partnership from uh, UNICEF. As a collaborative effort, the Identity Management Commission will be playing a huge role in achieving the set objectives. Linking of the National Identity Management System to the civil registry is critical to the long-term strategy. Appropriate links of the identity system to birth records are necessary to ensure that the national identity credential is as robust as possible. And also the sustainability is ensured through integration with continuous mechanisms to register the flow of new persons into the foundational identity systems at birth and death. I must say that this marks an important milestone in the national digital identity roadmap of the country. Nigeria said is a people that the country can change the course of action worldwide at the regional level with an efficient civil registration and vital statistics. When we hear of maternal mortality rates, under five mortality rates, or zero dose children, and the health of our people in terms of statistics, yes, those are statistics that we should care about and use to plan. But behind those numbers are real people who suffer, who are husbands, who are parents, who are children. And this system that we are putting in place will help us track that. But beyond that, we, at least in the Ministry of Health and Social Welfare, Mr. President, under your direction, have already committed to make maternal deaths in particular reportable. As we deploy the digital system, let us remain committing, committed to the vision of a high-performing, inclusive, and right-based focus CRVS in Nigeria, a system that stands as a testament of the nation's dedication to its people.
After the launching, the president inaugurates a National Coordination Committee of Civil Registration and Vital Statistics under the chairmanship of the National Population Commission. He implores them to demonstrate maximum commitments and hard work in ensuring that this task is successful. The Federal High Court has adjourned the case between the Labour Party and the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, till November 10, 2023. The APAPA-led faction of the Labour Party had, in an ex parte application, applied for an order of interim injunction restraining INEC from recognizing or according recognition to another person laying claim to the gubernatorial ticket of the party in Imo State on November 11, other than Ukeagu Ikeo Chuku Joseph, who emerged from the APAPA-led primary election of April 16, 2023. The group also sought for an order of mandatory injunction compelling INEC to recognize and upload the name of Ukeagu Joseph as the authentic gubernatorial and flag bearer of the party in Imo State. With barely 48 hours until Saturday's off-season elections in Bayelsa, Imo and Kogi states, the Nigerian Armed Forces has warned individuals intent on orchestrating havoc and disrupting the elections to have a rethink. This comes as the Defence Headquarters has uncovered plans by a certain element to disguise themselves in military gear purposely to cause a breach of peace. Director, Defence Media Operations, Major General Edward Buba made the disclosure in Abuja at a press briefing on the ongoing military operations by the armed forces of Nigeria to rid the country of terrorists, bandits, kidnappers and other criminal elements. Buba advised such individuals to stay clear, adding that the Nigerian army is better poised to match criminal elements. It is important to highlight that the armed forces of Nigeria is a disciplined and well-trained force that conducts its operations within the ambit of laws governing human rights and that of armed conflict. We have operated both internationally, as you all know, and as we are operating locally, we know the rules of engagement in the conduct of our operations. Nevertheless, to show zero tolerance for anyone that contravenes the rules of engagement, we have a standing court marshals in our theaters of operation to put on trial any erring personnel that is found wanting during operations. For the off-season elections in Bielsa, Imo and Kogi states, coming up this weekend, here is a message for those that plan to disrupt the process. We are aware of your plans to dress in military gear to mislead the public. Be assured of injurious consequences should you proceed with those plans. We will not allow our image to be dragged to the mud. You are hereby warned. Chairman of the House of Representatives Committee on Army, Abdullahi Mahmoudou, says it is the duty of members to position the army to tackle insecurity. Mahmoudou spoke on Tuesday during the committee's inaugural meeting at the National Assembly. The chairman also revealed that a comprehensive four-year work plan has been developed to enable the committee its legislative business. The committee's oversight mandate includes one, the Nigerian Army, two, the ammunition depot, fort, arsenals, reservations, and establishments, three, development projects of the Nigerian Army, Army barracks, landed property, and the utterances, and the annual budget estimates of the Nigerian Army. The scope of the committee 
The scope of the committee activities also include oversight of the Nigerian Army recruitment exercise. Honorable members, as you are aware, legislature is the only institution that distinguishes democracy from other forms of government. In most democracies, the military and the parliaments have been working together. That is what we also hope to achieve. Let's take this responsibility with all seriousness and understand that it is our duty to put the Nigerian army on a proper pedestal to be able to end the several challenges that we've been having in terms of insecurity in the country. We have a responsibility to Nigerians and we have to be seen to be doing it. And I enjoy on all of you to give maximum cooperation so that we'll be able to succeed. We'll take a break now, but still to come, President Tinubu stops electricity tariff hike, insists on subsidy. We'll have details of this and other stories when we return. Welcome back. A recap of our top stories now. Members of the Nigeria Labour Congress NLC and the Trade Union Congress TUC have mobilized their members for a protest at the Namdi Azikiwe International Airport in Abuja early on Thursday. The protest was part of a series of actions that the two labor unions say they will zero in on Imo State following the attack on the NLC President George Airo. Organized Labour had earlier declared a nationwide strike which will commence on Tuesday, November 14, also because of the face off with the Imo State government. We also told you that President Bolantinobo has launched the National Geospatial Data Repository and the Electronic Civil Registration and Vital Statistics System. The President also inaugurated the National Coordination Committee or CRVS under the National Population Commission. Speaking at the launch on Wednesday at the Presidential Villa, Tinubu says the system would improve the ability of federal agencies to generate vital statistics on important population events and migration. Now in case you missed any of our news bulletins, so for more updates, you can catch us on Limex World TV or log on to our website on www.tv360nigeria.com. You can also follow us on our social media platforms on Twitter, Instagram and YouTube at TV360 Nigeria or download our mobile app on Google Play Store and Huawei App Gallery. On Facebook, we're at TV360 Online. In the last three years, we have built a multi-purpose center, which is the envy of all in our constituency. And I can tell you that the people who are living there are already enjoying it. Guy, do you think what this man just said is true? See, I seriously doubt. I'm sure it's one of those that are silly lies. And wait, do you know there's a way to find out if these things he's saying is true or not? Ah. This is the construct app. It gives people like us a sure way to track implementation of constituency projects. It gives valid and verified information on location of projects, amounts allocated, amounts funded, the level of job done, and even the profiles of concerned legislators. You and I can post directly on this app. Are you serious? This is the go-to app if you want to know how our commonwealth is being expended by the government. Wow. Let's even see if what this man said is true. Show me. The Construct app is developed by Other People Nigeria with support from USAID and is available on both Google Play Store and Apple Store. Eh, yeah. and it's true. <laughs> of course, I told you. Welcome back. Let's join Tamilore Akinkuolie for the latest in the world of business. Over to you, Tamilore. Hello and welcome to Business News. 
President Bolatino Boa stopped the implementation of the ICAN electricity tariff and insisted a subsidy be paid on power consumed nationwide. The Minister of Power Adebayo Adelabu, who revealed this on Wednesday, says the federal government will investigate the legality of the five year lenses extension given to privatized power distribution and generation companies, stressing that the operation licenses of the firms would be would have expired on October 31, 2023. He added that a non implementation of this was actually actually causing a liquidity crisis in the sector, but emphasized that the president had refused to allow a rise in electricity rate. And the oil and gas sector in the country has failed to attract any foreign investment for the first time since the second quarter of 2021 and made the global push for cleaner energy. This is according to the National Bureau of Statistics. According to the MBS Nigeria Capital Importation Quarter 2 report, the federal government failed to convince international oil companies to invest in the oil and gas sector between January and June. The report comes on the heels of various divestment efforts by IOCs into cleaner energies and to neighboring countries as a result of commitments to the United Nations agenda that seeks to cut emissions from fossil fuel to zero by 2050. The report showed that the country had no foreign capital importation into the sector in the period under review. We'll take a break and be back with Stock Market Report. For the fourth consecutive time this week, the local bus closed further in the green zone on Thursday by 0.07% as investors gained $25 billion and the market cap standing at $38.89 and at the end of trading stock like UPDC and Mikio occupied the league of top advances that pushed the market higher on having a combined gain of 42 Kobo. Now at the end of trading in 6,169 deals, investors exchanged 569 volumes of deals valued at over 16 billion. Now over to our select global stocks, the bulls remained in charge for the UK FTSE at 0.65% while Japan's Nikkei rebounded from the previous trading and closed at 1.49% leaving only the U.S. down just at 0.61%. And that's all on Business and Stock Market Report. Over to you, Simi. Thank you very much for that update, Amilare. A humanitarian aid convoy medical supplies, conveying medical supplies to Al-Shifa Hospital of the Palestinian Red Crescent has been hit by fire in Gaza City. According to the International Committee of the Red Cross ICRC, the convoy included five trucks and two ICRC vehicles and was carrying life-saving medical supplies to health facilities to the Al-Quds Hospital of the Palestinian Red Crescent Society. The ICRC announced the convoy, however, altered its route and reached Al Shifa Hospital, where it delivered the medical supplies. For a second day in the row, the International Committee of the Red Cross, the ICRC, was able to escort six ambulances out of Gaza City and to the Rafah crossing with Egypt, where I'm currently stood. We also entered Gaza with several trucks of vitally needed medical assistance that we planned to donate to different facilities that are in desperate need of medical items, including the Al Goods Hospital, which is managed by the Palestinian Red Crescent, our main partner. Today, I just want to talk more about the reality of the situation of being here in this uh, war zone for the last 10 days or so. Um, in the last week, I've had to tell a father that his child has non-survivable burn injuries. We've had to treat with the team patients, young children that have been pulled out of the rubble after 48 hours. Today, we had a patient in theatre for further surgery, extensive surgery she's already had and had lost two children in the attack that wounded her. Uh, we're still getting patients every day with very significant injuries that are going to take a long time to heal. Uh, we're really running out of things now, dressings, particularly for the burns. We're running out of anaesthetic and analgesic drugs. The staff, both ourselves and the local staff here, are getting very worn out. Well, up next is Entertainment Report on News Now.
Popular Nigerian singer Adekule Gold has advised men to prioritize self-care, citing the fact that men tend to die younger than women. In a post on his official ex, Gold wrote, Men, take care of yourself. Grandma plenty past grandpa for this world. His message quickly gained traction, sparking conversation about the importance of men's health and the need for them to prioritize their well-being. Adekule's advice aligns with data from the World Health Organization, WHO, which indicates that men have a shorter life expectancy than women globally. 28-year-old Brazilian singer Delin Moraes has died after being beaten by a spider in the face. According to his wife, Moraes experienced body fatigue and had a bruise on his face that soon turned black, after which they sought medical care and thought that the singer was developing an allergic reaction. Soon after the treatment, he was discharged. However, his condition did not improve and he was admitted to the hospital again. Unfortunately, the doctors could not save the singer and declare him dead. His 18-year-old stepdaughter was also beaten by a spider on her foot and she is currently hospitalized and remains in a stable condition. Tamlare Akinkole, TV360 Lagos. Away from entertainment and out to sports, Nigerians were surprised after Super Falcons captain Desire Paranozi announced her retirement, ending her illustrious football career at the age of 29 through a post on her ex account, confirming it to her fans, friends, and family. Oparanose, who had a glittering career where she won the Women's Africa Cup of Nations, WAFCON four times, played at the World Cup four times, and had a train station temporarily named after her in France. In an exclusive chat with TV360 Nigeria, Oparanose says that the num is for footballers to play until they are not able to do so. But this is not the case for her because she has more to offer off the field. I don't think there is really a particular age that one should retire. You know, it's um, it's all about um, the person's personal belief, state of the mind, and all of that. So I know the norm has been to play until you're no longer able to play anymore. But it's for me, it's different. You know, I want to be able to do other things outside of playing actively. So. In as much as they still think I have, you know, more to offer on the field, I think I also can, you know, offer that off the field as well, you know. So, um, like me living active football doesn't mean I'm, I'm living entirely. I'm still going to be doing one or two, you know, behind the scenes when it comes to sports generally. So. And that wraps up our bulletin. Thank you for staying with us. See you another time. Bye for now.